There are two things we all learn as kids, boats float and concrete sinks. Well, this is a boat made of concrete and it was part of a secret fleet that's been hiding in plain sight for 100 years. The idea of a concrete boat defies intuition. The concept, however, is almost as old as modern concrete itself. In 1848, a Frenchman named Jean-Louis Lambat, a horticulturist, built several rowboats from a material he called fursament. He patented his invention, describing it as a metal net of wire and rods, formed into a shape and then filled with hydraulic cement. One of his small boats was exhibited at the Paris World's Fair in 1855. Another, lost in a lake, was rediscovered over a century later during a drought, intact and structurally sound. Lambot's invention was an answer to a question nobody was asking. The world's shipyards were masters of timber. The age of steel was dawning, promising ships of a size and strength previously unimaginable. Wooden ships were limited in length to about 300 feet because of the inherent strength of the material and the difficulties in fastening large timbers together. Steel promised to shatter these limitations. The idea of a stone boat seemed like a quaint novelty. For decades, the concept lay dormant. A global catastrophe would dredge it back to the surface. By 1917, the First World War was in its third year. The Allied war effort faced a crisis on the high seas. German U-boats were sinking merchant ships faster than they could be built. The demand for new vessels was desperate. The key material for their construction, steel, was critically scarce and reserved for the machinery of the front lines. Shipbuilders needed an alternative. They needed a material that was abundant, cheap, and could be worked by a labor force without the specialized skills of riveters and steel workers. In this climate of desperation, Engineers began to look again at Lambot's impossible idea. Naval architects, engineers, and sailors viewed the concept as a dangerous fantasy, a ship doomed to disaster the first time it encountered rough weather. The man who challenged this consensus was a Norwegian civil engineer named Nicolai Founier. He had already built concrete lighters in the Philippines and saw the potential for larger seagoing vessels. At his shipyard in Moss, Norway, he refined a method of construction that used readily available materials and eliminated the need for highly skilled steel workers. In 1916, Founier submitted plans for a seagoing concrete ship to the Norwegian Department of Shipping. The official response was hesitant. Since no established ship owner was willing to take the financial risk, Founier's own firm decided to build the first vessel at its own expense. The government granted reluctant permission stipulating that the ship, once built, could only operate in smooth water for a short, probationary period. The vessel was named the Namsenfjord. She was a modest ship, just 84 feet long with a cargo capacity of about 200 tons. After some initial mishaps with the launching car, the ship was finally lifted into the water by a massive floating crane on August 2, 1917. A few days later, she went on her official trial. On board were the director of shipping and his chief engineer. A southerly gale was blowing in the Christiania Fjord, setting up a heavy sea. The trial lasted four hours and was a complete success. The pilot expressed his satisfaction with the ship's easy movements, slight vibration, and steady steering into a headwind. The Namsen Fjord had proven the concept was not a fantasy. Soon after, Founier's shipyard launched the 1,000-ton Askelad. It was this ship that would provide the most dramatic proof of concrete's surprising resilience. In January 1919, while sailing from Havre, the Askelad encountered a strong wind and a heavy sea. At 9.15 in the evening, she struck a sandbank in the estuary of the River Somme in France. The ship was driven violently ashore, the shocks were so severe that the crew could not keep their footing on the bridge. Heavy seas swept the deck, carrying away a lifeboat. Fearing the vessel would break up on the next high tide, the entire crew abandoned ship. The ship was left for dead. In his report to the owners, the captain stated that the ship was still bumping violently at high tide, adding the remark, strange to say, the ship is quite tight. A few days later, an inspection showed the hull to be sound. Ten days after the grounding, a thorough inspection in London confirmed the finding. The ship was returned to service without any repairs to the hull. 
Across the Atlantic, the United States government had been watching Norway's experiments with intense interest. While the government deliberated, a private company took the initiative. In San Francisco, the San Francisco Shipbuilding Company, led by its president, W. Leslie Common, began construction on a vessel that would silence much of the skepticism. The ship was named the Faith. The Faith was, at the time of her completion, the largest concrete ship in the world. She was 320 feet long, with a cargo capacity of around 4,500 tons. Her construction was notable for its workforce. The vessel was built by about 45 house carpenters. Launched in March 1918, the Faith soon embarked on her maiden voyage. During the voyage, she ran into a stiff gale with 65 mile per hour winds. Observers reported that the Faith rode splendidly. Her skipper, Captain R. E. Connell, reported that she acted just like any other vessel and had not taken an inch of water into her hold. During a later journey, a slight leakage of fuel oil was discovered from one of the concrete tanks. The crew easily repaired the leak by steaming the tank and coating the inside with spar varnish, a simple fix that showed the material's repairability. The success of the faith and the ongoing Norwegian experiments convinced the U.S. government to act. On April 12, 1918, President Woodrow Wilson approved a $50 million emergency fund for the construction of concrete ships. The plans were considered so valuable that they became a target of espionage. A draftsman for the Emergency Fleet Corporation was later arrested for attempting to sell a nearly complete set of blueprints to a German agent. The plan was ambitious. Five new government shipyards were constructed specifically for building concrete vessels in Oakland and San Diego, California, Mobile, Alabama, Jacksonville, Florida, and Wilmington, North Carolina. In theory, these five yards had the capability to produce a combined tonnage of almost 2.5 million tons of shipping within 18 months. In June 1918, the shipping board contracted for 40 large concrete vessels. The program's chief engineer, R.J. Wig, stated the goal bluntly, the present emergency calls for ships, and their life is not of great importance at the present time. The first government-sponsored concrete ship, the Atlantis, was launched in Brunswick, Georgia, on November 21, 1918. The armistice ending the First World War had been signed just 10 days earlier. The desperate need that had spawned the concrete ship program vanished overnight. The complete program was slashed. The end of the war created a massive surplus of all types of shipping. In a peacetime economy, the heavier concrete ships could not compete with steel vessels. The government retired them because they were no longer economically necessary. Their short, strange history was already fading from memory. This is where their story ends and their legend begins. The wreck of the SS Atlantis lies half-submerged just 200 yards off the beach at Cape May Point, New Jersey. In 1926, a corporation acquired her hull to sink her as a platform for a ferry landing. Before she could be positioned, a storm blew in, driving the massive hull aground. The efforts to refloat her failed, and the Atlantis was abandoned to the sea. Today, broken in half by a century of storms, she is a declared historical site. Further south, half sunk in the sand flats near Galveston, Texas, rests the SS Selma. In early 1921, the tanker ran into the rock jetties at Tampico, ripping a large hole in her bottom. She was towed to Galveston, where shipbuilders decided it would be impractical to repair the damage. The solution was to dredge a channel specifically to tow her into the sand flats and sink her. In 1956, after the hull had been exposed to salt water for 34 years, tests were conducted on specimens taken from the wreck. The condition of the reinforcing rods was excellent. The general condition of the concrete itself was also found to be excellent. Perhaps the most colorful fate belongs to the SS Sapona. After the war, she was sold to a Bimini saloon keeper and used as a floating warehouse for rum runners during Prohibition. In 1926, a hurricane ran her aground in the shallow waters of the Bahamas. During World War II, her stationary hulk served a new purpose. U.S. training aircraft used her for bombing practice. Today, she remains where the hurricane left her, 
a skeletal wreck popular with divers, her concrete hull still largely intact. The great concrete fleece of the First World War were not failures of engineering. They were a technology born of necessity, a desperate gamble that paid off, only to be cast aside when the crisis passed. The silent, hulking remains of the ghost fleet that lie scattered on our coastlines are not monuments to a failed experiment. They are proof that when the need is great enough, even the most impossible ideas can be made real. They stand as enduring evidence that concrete, the very symbol of immovable weight, can be taught to float. The idea of the concrete ship did not die with the armistice of 1918. When the world was once again plunged into war two decades later, the desperate need for shipping tonnage led to a brief revival of the technology. During the Second World War, the United States constructed 24 self-propelled concrete steamships and 60 barges. Two of these vessels made a significant contribution to the war effort when they were intentionally sunk off the coast of France to serve as landing platforms in preparation for the invasion at Normandy Beach. Britain also contributed a few coasters, hundreds of barges, and a floating dock that is still in operation in Norway today. After the Second War, the technology evolved. The heavy conventional reinforced concrete of the World War era gave way to the lighter, stronger, and more sophisticated techniques of pre-stressed concrete. In the Philippines, a fleet of 19 2,000-ton capacity pre-stressed concrete barges designed by Alfred Yee have been in continuous ocean service since 1964, carrying both dry cargo and petroleum products. They have shown excellent performance, surviving groundings and collisions with readily repairable damage. The modern descendant of Lambot's rowboat is a marvel of engineering. The ARCOLPG terminal, constructed in 1975, is a massive 68,000-ton displacement pre-stressed concrete vessel. It is not a ship in the traditional sense, but a floating platform, 461 feet long, outfitted as a liquefied petroleum gas processing and storage facility. After its construction in Tacoma, Washington, it was towed 8,700 miles across the Pacific Ocean to its permanent mooring in the Java Sea, Indonesia. From a French garden to the open ocean, the story of the concrete ship is one of persistent innovation against a wall of skepticism. The great concrete fleets of the First World War were not failures of engineering. They were victims of peace. They were built for a world that ceased to exist the moment the guns fell silent. They were a technology born of economic necessity, a desperate gamble that paid off, only to be cast aside when the crisis passed.